Take, let's take our Bibles this um, morning and turn to Genesis, if you would, Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter 17 on uh, Sunday mornings, we've been uh, studying through the book of Genesis. And um, when we study the Word of God, there's two things that we must be aware of. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the Bible is uh, God's revelation of Himself to man. And uh, specifically, uh, the Bible is God's revelation of His plan to redeem man back to Himself. All of the Word of God is that one testimony. All of the Word of God points to really one event, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. God's revelation of Himself to redeem mankind. And also as we study the Word of God, we find that God is not only interested in the world as a whole, but also He's interested in individuals, and He also works in the lives of individuals. And so when we approach the Word of God, we don't just take the Word of God and say, well, yes, this is good, this applies to the world. We have to say and must say it applies to us individually. And that God wants to deal with us uh, individually, and he, uh, the fact is we need some help. Would you acknowledge that this morning, uh, that we all need help? Uh, no one has arrived, or maybe if someone has arrived, just stand up and tell us all about it and tell us how great you are and the fact that you know and have all the answers. Uh, but something we can be confident in is that in the Word of God we find the answers that we need. Now we find ourselves in Genesis chapter number 17 and we began uh, the first part of Genesis uh, 17. We studied verse 1 through verse 8 and what I'd like to do this morning is begin reading in verse 1 again but we'll, uh, our study this morning will uh, particularly uh, pertain to verse 9 through verse 17 but I want to begin verse 1 uh, for sake of context. And so Genesis chapter 17 verse number 1 the Bible says and when Abram was Ninety years old and nine. That's old. The Lord appeared to... A anybody 99 this morning? Okay, I just don't want to offend anybody. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy, fa but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. And this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house as, uh, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thine house, and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised, uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be uh, shall her name be. I want to stop there and really we're going to focus on this morning from verse 9 down to verse 14. But before we go to those particular verses, I want to again uh, give for us the setting that is found. In Genesis chapter number 16, well if we go back to Genesis 15 if you would, in Genesis 15 God came to Abraham and said, um, and Abraham was wondering at that time if uh, because of his age, he had been at that time ten years in the land that God had promised unto him, and he was dwelling there in tents, and after ten years there was still no son, no seed. And so God, or God came to Abraham and promised again, reiterated the promise of a seed, uh, 
of a son that would come from his loins. And Abraham said, well, maybe would it be that uh, I will pass away, but maybe my chief servant, Eliezer of Damascus, maybe his son will be the one to whom the promise will apply. And so at that time, if a master of a household uh, was to uh, pass away without a man seed after him, a man child after him, then his possessions would go to his chief servant, and in that case, Eliezer of Damascus. And God told Abraham, no, it would be from his own loins. And so um, hearing that in chapter 16, Sarah said to herself, well, I hear what God said. He said that it would come from Abraham's loins, but I did not hear God say anything about me. And so she devised a plan, and she thought to herself, well, Maybe what I can do is gave Hagar, my Egyptian maid, to Abraham to be her, uh, his wife, and then she can bear a son, and then I can take that son and make him my own son, and maybe that's how God is going to provide a seed. And we understand that that was not the case. And so we saw in chapter 16 how Abraham and Sarai and Hagar, we talked about how it was all in the flesh. They thought to themselves, well, God has a plan and God has a will, but we're going to make it happen our own way. And that is always a bad decision. To think, well, I know what is the right thing to do, but we're not going to do it that way. Uh, we're going to do it another way. And so that lack of faith translated in the manifestation of the flesh. And so we saw that God dealt with them. But after that one particular instance, and we know that Hagar was with child, and God told her he was with child, and God said, you're going to name him Ishmael. And we come to Genesis 17, we find that Ishmael is 13 years of age. So when God approaches Abraham in Genesis 17, it's been 13 years since the incident with Hagar. It's been 13 years that there's been no revelation from God. It's been 13 years where there's been silence. Now we know that things happened and life went on, but God is silent toward Abraham. And so when Abraham comes, we looked at last week, when God comes to Abraham after 13 years, now that Ishmael is 13 years of age and Abraham is 99 years of age, it is at this point that Abraham recognizes because of his age, he cannot produce a child. And so is it, it is today uh, with men and women. They reach a certain stage in their life when they cannot bear children. And so he considered the book of Romans as the deadness of Sarah's womb and also the deadness of his own flesh. And so that is exactly the uh, opportune time for God to come. Why? Because now God would communicate by coming to Abraham and reiterating the promise that a child would come through you, through, through you, that Abraham said, well, there's no way I can work around it. Because now I'm dead, and my, the, my uh, wife's womb is dead, and we cannot have children. And so God reminds Abraham that he is the Almighty God. And the fact that the covenant that God made with Abraham would come to pass despite Abraham's action in the flesh 13 years prior. And so God reiterates the promise, and He goes further with those promises. He doesn't change the promises, but He amplifies the promises. And we come to verse 9 through 14, and we study here that where God is going to, if you go, if you would, notice verse 11. I want to draw your attention to an expression we find. The Bible says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and notice, it, the circumcision, shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now this is important here for, uh, as we understand the context and as we approach this particular part, the expression, a token of the covenant. Uh, that's the title of the message this morning, a token of the covenant, or a subtitle if you'd like, the identity of God's people. The identity of God's people. Now, before this took place, we understand that God came to Abram after 13 years of silence. Thirteen years prior, we saw Abraham and Sarah try to make the promise of God happen in the power of the flesh. Uh, Sarah devised a plan through her maid Hagar, and God rejected their plan. God still has His plan, and His plan is going to come to pass. And so now God comes to Abraham with Abraham knowing that he is incapable of producing a seed because uh, he was now too old. This was a perfect time for God to intervene. And so Abraham had to become completely helpless and weak in order to be fully dependent upon God. And so we see here, as we look at our uh, text, I want to see three truths as we come here to now. God comes to Abraham. And now remember the covenant that God made with Abraham. 
God put Abraham asleep to make sure that Abraham understood that this uh, covenant is an unconditional covenant. In other words, there's a difference between a conditional covenant and an unconditional covenant. A conditional covenant is this. God says, you do this, you get a blessing. You don't do this, you get a curse. That's a condition. There's a, there's a condition placed on the covenant. But this covenant that God made with Abraham is an unconditional covenant. In other words, this covenant is not dependent upon Abraham because Abraham failed, did he not? Again and again. But yet the covenant is still going to take place. And so now God comes to Abraham and God is going to present and ask Abraham for him to do something. Now I want to understand here that when we, we deal here with the subject of circumcision, which we find its inception here in Genesis chapter 17, we do not approach this on, in the physical realm, we approach this in the spiritual realm. Because there's a spiritual lesson for us here, not just a physical lesson, because the Bible tells us it is a token of the covenant. A token of the covenant. And really God is going to see here if Abraham is going to have faith in this covenant. And demonstrate his faith in this covenant. Now consider three truths this morning. First of all, I want us to consider the requirement of this covenant. The requirement of this covenant. Now often we could say, well, okay, God came to Abraham and asked him and required for him and his household for all the man child to be circumcised. But notice here the requirement is greater than that. Notice, understand verse 9. The Bible says, And God said unto Abraham, Notice, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, verse 10, which, thou, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. So notice here, I want us to consider first of all the requirement of this covenant. You say, well, what is the requirement? It is this, obedience. Did you get that? Before there is any mention of the circumcision, God asks Abraham to keep this covenant, to remember this covenant. And so obedience was required on the part of Abraham. Now, I believe this is a, a vital truth that we must understand as it pertains to obedience because God asked for Abraham's obedience before he revealed to Abraham the specifics. Did we get that? God asked for Abraham's obedience before he uh, spoke to Abraham about the specifics of the keeping of the covenant. And so, by the way, it is easy so often to want to hear what the specifics command are before we decide if we are going to respond in obedience or not. But to the contrary, we must first determine that we are going to obey God no matter what the command is. And so that's the challenge that God poses to Abraham. He says, you're going to keep my covenant. Will you obey this covenant? We will often weigh the commands. That's what we often do in our minds and in our hearts. We often weigh the commands of God, the instructions of God, the precepts of God that we find in His Word. And uh, we often weigh them to see if we're going to choose to obey them. But we determine our decision often, making often decisions based upon what we would like to do and what we would not like to do. But God said, thou shalt keep my covenant. This does not sound like a suggestion. It sounds like an imperative. You see, Abraham was not asked to examine the worthiness of the command. Abraham was asked to examine his willingness to obey. You see, God does not come to man and ask, Would you like to do this? Do you like what I said? God comes to man declaring, You must obey. You see, we do not question the worthiness of the command. We must acknowledge the worthiness of the one who is declaring the command. And God just reminded that of Abraham as he said in uh, the first, first verse, I am the Almighty God. You know, that thing is important because the Bible tells us, Jesus spoke of that in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He says, why, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, in that particular context, he's referring to the Sermon on the Mount. 
And what he is referring to is many people want to identify with God. Many people want to identify with Christ, but often they'll take the commands of Christ and they'll weigh them and say, well, I don't think I'm going to keep that because I don't like this aspect. And so we ought to, and so the Lord, the question asks is, why do you call me Lord, but yet you do not do the things which I say? You see, there has to be a determination that whatever the Lord Jesus Christ teaches, we have made a determination already before we hear the command to obey. You see, it is a pattern in Scripture for God to request obedience and complete submission before He declares the specifics. You see, our opinion about a command should not be the deciding factor on whether we choose to obey it or not. Now, we find this exemplified in Paul's life. If you go with me to Acts chapter number 9, uh, we know that uh, the Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church. He threw Christians in jail. Uh, he gave false witness or uh, testimony against them. Uh, he did many things that was contrary to Christ. But when the Lord Jesus Christ met him, notice the encounter in Acts 9 verse 3. And as he, that Saul at the time, his name was Saul, he was changed to Paul, but as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he, that Saul, fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Notice what he says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You see, Saul did not respond to a specific task. He predetermined that he would, do, that he would be obedient to the voice of the Lord by this question, What will you have me to do? In other words, it matters not what you ask of me, I will do it. Now, he did not know what his life would be like. Stoned to death, beaten, left for dead, shipwreck. He gives all the la that list to the church at Corinth, and he lists to that church all the things that he went through. And I'm sure that if he had uh, looked at the beginning of his ministry, if he had said, what will thou have me to do? I think that if God had revealed all those things that would happen in the life of the Apostle Paul, he probably would have said, well, I'm going to opt out. But you see, that's not how it works. We don't determine the worthiness of the commands or what God asks us to do. We simply determine in our hearts, I am going to willingly submit myself and obey the voice of God. Now we know when it comes to Genesis 17, this is something that pertains only to the Jew. It is not something that is required today of, of us. It is not something that we have to do in order to uh, be saved or any of those things. If this is specifically for the Jewish nation, which would separa separate the Jewish nation from all other nations. We'll cover that in just a little moment. But I was looking in an illustration here. An engineer received the wrong orders. Some years ago, a passenger train was rushing into New York as another train was emerging. There was a head-on collision. Fifty lives were lost. An engineer was pinned under his engine, frightfully injured, and tears were running down his cheeks. In his dying agonies, he held a piece of yellow paper crushed in his hand, and he said, Take this. This will show you that someone gave me the wrong orders. Now can I say, God will never give us the wrong orders. But often that's what we do. We rationalize our mind and say, well, we know what Jesus Christ expects of us in the Sermon on the Mount, but you know, I just don't think it applies for our day. I don't think I can do this, and I don't think that I'm willing to submit myself to this. God will never give us something that is not right. The Bible tells us that the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. You see, God never will ask His people to do something that is unreasonable. God will never ask His people to do something that is not just and good. And so we see the requirement of the, this covenant here. Before we consider the idea of being circumcised here, we have to consider here that what God asked Abraham above all else was obedience. Now, that's the requirement of this covenant, but secondly, we see the reminder of this covenant. The expression shows us in verse 11, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. 
Now the word covenant in the section verse 9 through verse 14, the word covenant appears six times in this, in this portion. Therefore what God commanded of circumcision for Abraham to do is connected to the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now abiding by this command was something that only the Jewish nation did. As a matter of fact, all other nations would be referred to as those of the uncircumcision. And so this was kind of well, only for the Jewish people. This token would distinguish the Jewish people from all other people. Uh, here is the important question for us. Why did God require Abraham and his household to be circumcised? The Bible answers that question. It tells us that in verse 11. It, the circumcision, shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now it is important here because often people, and particularly the Apostle Paul deals with that in the New Testament time, the Jewish people uh, try to make the believers in the New Testament say you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the law, you have to do this, and the Apostle Paul wrote, he says, no, as a matter of fact, you don't. Whether it's circumcised, circumcision, or uncircumcision, it matters not. And so they were teaching that that was part of salvation. There was many ideas, but here, even in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, it never says that you have to do this in order to, number one, receive the covenant. He never plays that condition. He says it is a token of the covenant. Now, what does the word token mean? The word token means this. Other words that could be used for that is a flag. A beacon, a monument, a sign, or a mark. Another word that is closely related to token would be the evidence. And so we think about, uh, you know, many things in our minds about something that is a kind of a testimony. Uh, for example, as uh, the armies used to, to, to fight back then, it's not uh, so much like that today, but there they're, were always flag bearers. And as the, uh, uh, the battalions would walk towards the other with the flags, uh, as they would conquer the other ones, they were facing in front of them. Then when they would reach the other end and defeat the enemy, they would plant the flag to signify uh, we have war won this battle. It was a sign. Okay? That flag was a representation of the fact that the battle was won, that mountain was conquered, that battlefield was won, that, that battle was won. And so it was a flag. It was a, a beacon. Another word we could use here, it was a mark or a monument. Often there are monuments in the Word of God where we see this is something they, what God wants them to do in order for them to consider and to remember what God has done and the promises that God has made. You see, this was not the first time the word token appears in, in God's revelation. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 9 where we find the word used for the first time. In Genesis chapter 9, if you see, the first we see the word token used in reference to the sign God gave Noah after the flood. Notice Genesis chapter 9 verse 12. The Bible says this to Noah, and God said in Genesis 9 12, this is the, the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. You see, God told Noah that he would set a bow in the cloud as a reminder of the covenant that he had established between himself, Noah, and every living creature. The bow in the cloud would be a token, a flag, a sign, the evidence of the covenant made with man. God promised in this covenant that He would never again judge the world by a worldwide flood. And with this promise, He provided a reminder to Himself and a reminder to man. You see, this token or this sign would be a reminder several times. God says, and I will look at that bow in the cloud and I will remember the covenant that I have made. You see, we find yet another scripture in which 
makes reference to a token. We find, if you go with me to Exodus chapter number 12, after the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, in chapter number 12, there's another a place where the word token is used. If we go to verse number 12, we know that uh, when Moses was sent to Egypt to deliver the people out of the uh, Egyptian bondage, we find that the ten plagues where God intervened, and God showed that He was more powerful than the false gods of the Egyptians. And here in Genesis chapter 12 is the last plague. Now we know the last plague is the plague of the unborn, the, the firstborn of every household, whether it be man or beast. And notice in Exodus 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of, the, of, of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And notice verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So you notice in verse 14, he says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. And so notice verse 13 tells us that it shall be a, for you uh, to be to you a token, a sign, a, a flag, the evidence. You see, what were the children of Israel instructed to do? Well, verse 5 and 6 tells us in Exodus 12, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And so God instructed them to when take the blood of the lamb and to uh, spread it on the doorpost of each household. So a lamb was slain. The blood of the lamb would be placed on the outside doorpost of each household. Why was the blood on the doorpost necessary? The blood was a token, a sign, a representation. Uh, and with that token, God would see the blood and would pass over that household. Now understand, we see a pattern now when we consider the term token. Because we find it, yes, in Genesis chapter 17, referring to Abraham and the circumcision. But before that, notice the token of the, uh, the ark or the bow in the sky was a token. But again, for God, uh, for man and for God. God says, I will see and I will remember. And so it is with man. Man sees the bow in the cloud, and man remembers the covenant that God made with man. And here it is the same thing with the blood on the doorpost. You see, yes, it was for man, uh, so that man would see it as a token of, I believe, I follow, I'm obedient to God. And then also it was a token for God, because as God would see the blood on the doorpost, He would pass over that household. So, we see and understand that a token has a twofold purpose. Man, on the one end, is reminded of God's omnipotence, and God is reminded of man's obedience. Do we get that? That's the pattern we find in the Scriptures. A token is a reminder to man of God's omnipotence, and a token is a reminder to God of man's obedience. That's what that token is. That token, when God required Abraham uh, for his household to be circumcised, it was a reminder uh, to man th that uh, God is omnipotent, and I'm submitting to that omnipotence, and then it would be a reminder to God that man has been obedient. A token is also, thirdly, a reminder to the world of the believer's separation. You see... Because the circumcision would distinguish the Jewish people from all other nations. We also see that in the case of Exodus chapter number 12, the blood on the doorpost would separate the Israelite households, the people of God who believe the word of God, from all the other Egyptian households. And so a token is a reminder to man of God's omnipotence, a token is a reminder to God of man's obedience, and a token is a reminder of the world, uh, to the world of the believer's separation. I want us to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 in the New Testament. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to be uh, spending some time here in the New Testament, just to see what the Word of God says and deals here with the subject, but in 
First Thessalonians chapter or Second Thessalonians chapter number one. Notice verse number three. What he says. He says this. Second Thessalonians one three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is, notice, a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, it goes on and on to the end of the chapter, but notice the word we find in verse 5. The word manifest token simply means it is an indication. The lives of these believers, the way they were living their lives, according to verse 4, your patience and faith in persecution and tribulation. You see, their patience and faith to the world was a manifest token. It was an indication to the world of who God was in the judgment of God. So, what did this token indicate? This token, particularly in verse 5, indicated the righteousness, the righteous judgment of God. You see... The idea of being a token has a threefold purpose. There's a two, uh, twofold purpose first, and one pertains to God and man, but also there's, I believe, the token has a representation towards the world. A separating, it is an indication of separation from the believers from the world. In Titus 2.14, the Bible says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You see, the way we live our lives in this world is an indication to the world that we recognize and reminded of God's omnipotence and God is reminded of our obedience. And that is a token to the world that we are a peculiar people, different than the world, zealous of good works. 1 Peter 2.9 puts it this way, but ye... Are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Notice he says, You're a chosen generation, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, you're a peculiar people. It doesn't mean you're weird and strange. It means you stand out in the world. Notice why. That ye should show forth the praises of Him. Show forth the praises to who? To the world. You see, we come unto the Lord and recognizing the omnipotence of God as we submit ourselves to Him in obedience to Him and because we understand that He called us out of darkness into His marvelous light and this is a token to the world as the world looks at our lives and says there's something different. There's a, something that indicates that they're separate from us. That they're different. 1 Peter 2.11 puts it this way. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You see, he encourages the believers, remind, you're reminding you, uh, look, there has to be a token, there has to be an indication in your life that you belong to God, that you're a stranger, that you're a pilgrim, so that when God visits those who are unsaved uh, that speak against you, uh, by your good works, as a token, they may glorify God in the day of visitation. You see, we see first of all, important, the requirement of this covenant is obedience. That's what God wants of all of us. <coughs> Obedience. And secondly, we see the reminder of this covenant. God says, you are a token. The life that you live is an indication. It is a token. But thirdly, I want us to consider the reproach of this covenant. 
He talks about the requirement as obedience, the reminder, a token. Circumcision would be a token. But thirdly, notice there's a reproach that would come with this covenant. If we go back to Genesis chapter number 17, notice God gives a warning. And this is important to understand this warning because many people have said, well, this is what it says. But let's just see what the Bible says. Verse 12 says this. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Just a side note here. Why was it specifically given to eight days old? Well, the, spe the specifics of it, uh, we understand that God just simply declared it, and so they were to obey it. On the eighth day after the birth of a man child, he was to be circumcised. Now, uh, medically speaking, we understand that it was discovered in 1940. That wait a minute, that's the best day in a ch after a child's birth for him to be circumcised because uh, that's when uh, that, that it is the best time medically to do that. And so there was a, a study that was done on it, and I'm thinking, well, they finally caught up to God. But we keep moving in the Bible, says, verse 13, He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And notice verse 14, And the uncircumcised man, who, uh, or child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. Notice the expression, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He does not say, that if you don't circumcise a man-child in your household, then the covenant is nullified. That's not what he says. Why? Because the covenant is an unconditional covenant. But notice what does happen. It is not that God nullifies His covenant. It is that God says that that particular individual shall be a reproach. That particular individual shall be cut off from His people. As identifying as being part of God's people. And I believe an application for us Christians, I'll go and st give a study here in just a moment, but an application for us as God's people, we have to understand that the one requirement that God expects of us is obedience. And our obedience is a token to the world of our recognition and what God has done in our own lives. And if we are unwilling to obey God and to show to the world a token, then I believe that God crosses the line and says, you're cut off from my people. You do not ident identify and it's possible for someone that is a Christian to live such a life that he is not a token because of his failure to obedience to God to be among God's people. Isn't that what God said to the church in the book of Revelation? The church at Ephesus that had uh, forgot their first love? God said this, He said, I will remove thy candlestick. I will remove your influence and your impact in this world. And it is true today that many Christians have decided, well, look, you know, I, I am a Christian. I'll say, Lord, Lord, I'm glad that my sins are forgiven, but I refuse to be obedient to God. God says, in effect, you're going to be cut off. You're going to, you're going to have no impact in this world. You have no influence in this world. And that's going to be cut off from the identity that you ought to have with the people of God. Now, in our study of this idea of circumcision, I want us to go to Romans chapter number 2. And now, on Sunday evenings, we've been studying through the book of Romans. And so, uh, if you've been there on Sunday evenings, you understand uh, uh, that the Apostle Paul has dealt with uh, the circumcision. But notice here, in Romans chapter 2, I want us to do a little quick study, just for sake of reminder and for uh, uh, the truth's sake here. In Romans 2.28, the Bible says this. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Peter here, in the struggle here, the, the Jewish, there are some Jewish believers who had come into the church, who were part of the church. Uh, many of those were called Judaizers who were teaching and telling the people, you have to be circumcised. And the Apostle Paul writes, says, no, it is not a Jew, someone that does things outwardly. A Jew, a true Jew, is someone that is one inwardly. It is the circumcision of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter. Why? Because what they were doing is, they were saying, well, if you do the act of circumcision, then you get the praise of men. But not of God. And later in chapter 3, notice Romans chapter 3, verse 30. He says this, 
seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. You see, so the, 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 the truth here, it is not the fact that we ought to emphasize circumcision. It is all the fact that we ought to emphasize the faith of Abraham. You see, because the faith of Abraham in doing the circumcision was exactly that. It was a testimony. It was a token of the faith of Abraham by his obedience. And he says, an uncircumcision through faith. If we go to chapter 4, notice Romans chapter 4, verse 9. The Bible says this. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? Now, the apostle Paul is just simply going to explain to them something about Abraham, their forefather. He says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. That's what we say. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. you see what he says here? Uh, notice he says in verse 10 again, that Abraham, when God said that his faith was counted for righteousness, happened two chapters previous in Genesis chapter number 15, when God gave the promise of his seed and the Messiah, and Abraham believed God and the Bible, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And so that's how Abraham was saved. And so understand, he says that circumcision is not part of salvation because when Abraham's faith was counted for righteousness, he was not circumcised, he was uncircumcised. And the Bible says, and he, verse 11, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed upon them also. And he says in verse 12, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So you see what he says? We like to say, well, look, uh, uh, we say, well, look, let's look at the subject of circumcision. That's what he was required to do. No, circumcision was simply this. It was a token. It was an indication of the faith of Abraham, of the omnipotence of God. It was a token, an indication to God that man was obedient, but it was also a token to the world. Notice, you remember, God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. In that name change, that name Abraham means father of multitudes. There's a reproach that comes with that, doesn't it? Why? Because he had no son from his wife. And so there's a reproach that comes with his name, with the identity, as Abraham would say, well, why do you change your name? Well, God changed my name. I didn't make that decision. God said, your name is going to be no more Abraham, but Abraham. And so there's a reproach that would come with that identity, but also now there would be another test. You see, another testimony to the world, something that would separate Abraham and the people, the Jewish people from all other nations, because God says, I want to show the world that my people have faith in me and my word. In Philippians 3.3, 3, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and said this, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He says as believers, we are the, our testimony is a token to the world. We are the circumcision. We stand out. We are the indication to the world of God's omnipotence and our obedience to Him. Colossians 2.10 says, and ye are complete in Him, that's Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also we are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein we are uh, risen with Him through faith in the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. Now, here in the connection, he's talking about baptism. Let me make a side point here, uh, just to understand baptism here. I believe that for the New Testament, baptism would equate to what circumcision circumcision would be in the Old Testament. Because the circumcision would be a testimony of the faith of Abraham in God to the world. And baptism is exactly the same. The baptism is someone that has recognized their sinfulness before God. They've recognized that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for their sin debt and they've placed their faith and trust in Him and they come publicly and they want to let everybody know that they've placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and they make that public. It is a sign. It is a token. It is a flag waving your banner to the world. says, I believe in God. Jesus Christ is my Savior and I want everybody to know 
And they follow the Lord in believers' baptism. You see, that is New Testament circumcision. Or identifying, identifying as God's people in the world. You see, circumcision was not intended to be an expression of saving faith on the part of the child, but it was a submissive faith on the part of the parent. The refusal to circumcise a man-child would manifest willful unbelief in the covenant of God. That's what that did. And so if the Jews said, I'm not going to circumcise my child, it was a testimony of this, their unbelief. Their lack of obedience to God. Their lack of submission to God. Ephesians 2.11 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, you used to be called uncircumcision, because you were not a Jew. By that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see, you used to be called the uncircumcision. You used to be not part of this covenant of promise. But now, in Christ Jesus, we have been spiritually circumcised. We've identified with Jesus Christ. And so, you understand here that what we're saying here is that it is a token of the covenant. And really, as we baptize, live our lives, identifying in Jesus Christ, living separate from the world, we understand that our lives is a token of the covenant of God. It is the identity of God's people. But here's the question. Are we willing to be considered pilgrims and strangers in this world? Are we willing to be identified as a peculiar people? And as I said earlier, the idea of being a peculiar people doesn't mean that someone looks at you and says, man, that person is a little strange. It simply means that as peculiar people, we identify with Christ. You know, the idea of separation, we talk about being separate from the world. The idea of separation is not separating from something. It is separating to someone. You see, the token to the world is the fact that we have separated ourselves to the Lord. And because we have separated ourselves to the Lord, the world looks at us and says, that's a strange people. Not because we're trying to be strange. You see, there, there's a, probably a good portion of people that they're trying to be different. They're trying to be strange. They're trying to appear to the world like they're different and they do everything in their lives to appear to be a certain way because they say, well, well what we have to do is we have to, wow, the world does that, so we have to do the opposite of that. And, oh, that's what the world does over here. Look at what they do, so we have to do uh, something that is opposite. Oh, that's what they say. We have to do the opposite. That's not what we strive for. We don't strive to be at odds with the world. What we strive is we strive for Jesus Christ. We strive to identify with God. We strive to identify with His command. And as we do that, we are separated from the world, not because we want to be apart from the world. We're separated from the world because we want to be like God. Amen. And God makes us different. You see, it is a token. It is simply this, a token of the covenant. And we can apply this to our lives today as we have a desire to identify as God's people. And we often, no doubt, struggle with things. Well, I don't want people, I don't want to say anything or do anything that would cause someone to say, well, he's a Christian. And I want to say, why not? Is there any shame in claiming the name of Christ? Is there any reproach that comes with the fact that our sins have been forgiven? All of our sins have been wiped away clean in the person of Jesus Christ? There is no shame there. And may the Lord help because he says here, I believe here, he, as, he, as he speaks on the reproach of this covenant, that as we consider this covenant, that God will say, if we refuse to obey Him, if we refuse to be a token of what He's done for us, then I believe that God's own people can become a reproach to God. You refuse to identify my, as my people, now you stand at odds, and you may look like the world and do all that the world does. 
And I believe that often that's what happens in the lives of the Christian. And so the question I have for you this morning is this. Would you be a token? Would you be a token? Would your life, would you allow your life to be an indication? Would you wave the flag of identity with Christ high and identify as God's people in this world? There will not be any difference until we do that. We'll say, well, how, how, Pastor, how do I do this? How do I demonstrate that? By faith. That's how. Live in faithful obedience to God and obeying God by faith. Saying, Lord, would you simply show me what you want me to do? The Bible tells us he gives all things. He gives us all things that pertain unto this life and godliness. You see, his word has given us, but we must begin by determining as God comes to Abraham and says, would you simply obey? And we must do the same. And so may the Lord help us.